started. Welcome everybody, good afternoon. My name is Sara Gomez and I'm the Assistant Director of the Environmental Studies Program. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Hope Cunningham Environmental Lecture Series, which is made possible thanks to the generosity of TAPS alumni, Daphne Hope Cunningham and Roland Hope. If you would like to receive alerts about this lecture series or see the, the rest of the roster for the fall semester, I encourage you to visit these links. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. So as you may notice, the chat is disactivated, but if you do have questions, we encourage you to put them on the Q&A section, or if you prefer to say your questions out loud, you are welcome to raise your hand at the end of the talk and we'll, we'll let you uh, use your voice. And just so you know, the meeting is being recorded and if you want to access this recording, you can go to our website in a week or two. Before I introduce the speaker, I would like to make an announcement. As you know, election day is happening next week. So the Environmental Studies Program, the Office of Sustainability and the TAPS Institute of the Environment will be hosting a virtual space the day after the election for people to just get together and talk, talk about the results. And there is no agenda, it's just a space to, to, to talk with uh, staff and students in, in our three programs. So I'm going to copy the link for that as well in the chat for anybody who would like to join us. And finally, before we get started, I'd like to thank our fantastic partner, the Urban Environmental Policy and Planning Department for co-sponsoring today's events with environmental studies. And now Dr. Mary Davis, who is the chair of that department will introduce today's speaker. Mary. Okay, there we go. I was muted. Um, so can you hear me now? Wonderful, thanks. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Earl Phillips, um, a uh, part-time lecturer in my department. Earl is a legal scholar and a practicing attorney in the area of environmental and energy law. His legal career spans cases um, from brownfield, solar, air, water, waste, you name it, Earl has done it. He's the co-founding chairman of the environmental and energy practice at Robinson and Cole, and he's actively contributed to the service of his profession and is currently a fellow in the American College of Environmental Lawyers. Earl's a visiting scholar at Wesleyan University and at Tufts, he teaches a very highly, uh, highly rated um, spring class in my department, um, as Coco mentioned, UEP. Um, the course is called Environmental Law. And I encourage upper level undergraduates to consider taking it next semester. I think you will be um, uh, very interested and engaged in what Earl has to tell us today. So uh, thanks, Earl, on to you. Well, well, great. And first of all, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Colin, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And also, Mary, thanks for the generous introduction. Appreciate it. Nice to see everyone's face. Uh, you know, it's, uh, again, this is, strange for you guys and I know it's been a crazy year for you guys um, similarly in well that you're in my teaching chamber as well as my office uh, as well as my house and if you hear my dog barking everyone understands how that goes uh, so you know I'll apologize in advance if someone comes to the door and the dog uh, starts up but um, yeah this has been a, an interesting year it, it, our, our firm has been around about 175 years and this is I asked somebody, I said, is this the first time we've, for an extended period, closed our doors? And the answer to that, of course, was, was yes. Uh, you know, we've closed our doors, kept our virtual doors open and, and uh, you know, met when it was, uh, was or is critical. And, uh, and that's the way life has been since March 12th for, for us. And I know I was on the Tufts campus teaching on the very last day before uh, you went virtual in the spring. Um, but anyway, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, let me just move forward. This is my topic, obviously. Uh, it's been an incredible year of change. And in fact, when I was uh, up on campus uh, teaching the course in the spring, I had to keep saying to the students, well, this is likely to change and that's likely to change and they're going to change the Clean Water Act definition. And soon you will see a different uh, you know, a review process under the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, 
to understand where things have gone over the last four years or three years and X number of months, I, you know, I thought a, a bit of a review of where we have been and how we got there uh, was sort of the first order of business. Well, second order of business. The first order of business is naturally what every lawyer does is disclaim that this, you know, whatever I say today or whatever I might say in the course of the next hour is certainly not the sentiment of Tufts or Wesleyan or my law firm, Robinson Cole. It's really my thought process and my observations. Give context. Uh, you know, clearly the environmental movement started before uh, 1970, uh, but our first Earth Day uh, was uh, April 22nd, 1970, 50 plus years ago now. So this is really sort of a remarkable year and a, and a remarkable time to be revisiting many of the cornerstones and the keystones of our environmental program. And what I wanted to do in, in the course of the next few minutes is just acquaint you with some of the things that have, uh, you know, really been remarkable achievements uh, and then how those, you know, are being strategically and, and fundamentally attacked. Um, so we had a very good start kicking off uh, in 1969 with the National Environmental Policy Act. It is one of the, the programs covered in the course I teach, but this law was set up because it was recognized that the federal government, the federal agencies, the federal spending power, uh, all could have a profound effect on the environment. And this law had just a, it was a very simple law. It said, you know, to the extent there's a major federal action. In other words, when the government spends a lot of money, when the government opens up its lands, when the government gives a lot of permits, to the extent there's a major federal action that has the potential to significantly affect the environment, there's a process that that agency has to go through. That process may call for an environmental assessment or a full-blown environmental impact statement, uh, looking at all of the alternatives uh, and looking at the cumulative effect uh, of each of the things that are proposed in that agency's action. So it was a huge law and it is the most copied law around the globe. Um, more countries have something that is a version of our National Policy, Environmental Policy Act than any other law. Many states uh, in this country have what are called mini NEPAs, uh, which would be state-specific environmental policy acts. Incredibly important law, incredibly valuable tool, um, and has, has caused us to reconsider and think about any number of proposed actions. Then the Clean Air Act comes along in 1970, and the Clean Air Act uh, has really five different components, but you should be aware that it had a, a stratospheric ozone component. Um, you know, that became ultimately uh, swept into the Montreal Protocol. It had uh, a mobile source component uh, with emission standards. It has a hazardous air pollutant component. And most importantly, it said, we're gonna have a, a program that deals with criteria pollutants, you know, a certain important criteria pollutants that <clears throat> will have to meet in each state and at the, across the country, primary and secondary standards, primary standards for public protection of public health, secondary standards for protection of welfare, which really translated into the environment, but, it, but in a hugely complicated law, but important law. 1972, we have what is close to our modern day Clean Water Act. And the, you know, the gatekeeper issue in that law has always been, what is the water of the United States? And, and frankly, what I, you know, when I'm teaching the course and when I tell the students and when I tell my clients is, how ironic that the cornerstone and the gatekeeper issue in this law was the water of the United States. I still can't answer that question. And I've been practicing environmental law my entire adult and professional life. Um, I still can't answer that question with great accuracy. Um, and it varies, uh, again, depending on the administration. 73, another good year. Uh, you know, we, we finally recognized that biodiversity, uh, you know, was uh, under siege a little bit. And frankly, we needed to start identifying listed and listing endangered species and threatened species, as well as their critical habitats. And then establishing protections uh, for those species to make sure that they weren't 
taken and, and taken in that law means harassed, harmed, killed. Um, but also we said, gee, the, the federal government, we don't want the federal agencies inadvertently through their actions harming these species. So we set up a program and a protocol to make sure that as the government acted, uh, those same species and or their habitat would not be impacted. A lot of folks felt we were done at the point where we had protected air and, and water and generally the National Environmental Policy Act program for, for having impact statements done, but obviously we weren't. Uh, so there was a need for more programs. Obviously, by 1976, folks were saying, there are a heck of a lot of chemicals in commerce that we know nothing about. And there were more coming as uh, in industrial uh, communities and activities expand. And so we need a law that will focus on a certain level of review and analysis before uh, chemicals pop into commerce and before people are exposed to them, whether in a drinking cup, uh, whether in uh, you know, a glue that it, it attaches the sole of their shoe to their shoe or, or whatever else. So Toxic Substances Control Act comes along and it also specifically calls out and uh, addresses PCBs. But we're still not done. Uh, what the Resource Conservation Recovery Act came out in 76 and 80, it was a response to saying, we're generating a lot of waste. We're generating as a, as a civilization and a country, a whole lot of solid waste. So we've got to close uh, some of those open dumps. And we're also generating a whole lot and ever more hazardous waste. And we have to regulate that hazardous waste. And we have to regulate it from its point of inception to its point of ultimate disposal. So that became known as the cradle to grave regulation of hazardous waste. Seemed like a good idea, uh, has been a very effective program at both managing hazardous waste and where it ends up, but also uh, making sure we don't have and don't create uh, dump sites uh, that are, are legacies for the future. We're still not done. On the heels of, of the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, that hazardous waste law that I mentioned, uh, it was recognized that there were a whole lot of companies and a whole lot of locations that had been in operation, but blinked out of existence. So you couldn't really regulate them, but you still needed to clean them up. So that long list of words there, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, forget all of those and just remember that's Superfund. And when you read about Superfund sites, uh, and those might be old landfills, those might be old dumps, those might be old factories, or uh, most recently, uh, they've increasingly been sediment sites such as you know, the Passaic River, which I'm working on, and, and other locations where contaminants would have perhaps been discharged over the banks uh, or out of pipes and ended up, uh, in, you know, finding residence in the sediments uh, below a water column. And so Superfund became a, a law to deal with those legacy sites. And it's really a liability scheme. It's who is responsible and how do we clean them up? A lot of people said, okay, finally, we're done in 1980. Uh, but again, uh, there were some bad things happening. There was a terrible incident in Bhopal where a number of people were blinded by a chemical release and, 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 and thousands uh, were injured and probably about 4,000 died. I think it was 3,800 died. There was a similar a bad incident of chemical release in West Virginia on the heels of that. And in, in both situations, people said, no one knew. No one knew that those chemicals that weren't wastes, uh, they were simply sitting there as raw material or inventory to be sold. No one knew what those materials would do either when a fire occurred, an explosion occurred, or they came in contact with each other. Along comes the emergency planning and community right to know law. And that law was designed to say, gee, uh, Communities should know what's there. First responders should know what's there, particularly if it's certain types of materials above certain threshold planning quantities. Uh, and so that law uh, took effect and we said, we should do some planning around how you respond, uh, whether you're Tufts University or Wesleyan University, if you have a large science uh, facility, there should be information that is provided uh, and a participation in coming up with a good plan. We continue to roll on with the Superfund Amendments and Reauthorization Act 
and we hit the late, eight, <laughs> late 80s and we find, okay, we have a problem with stratospheric ozone in the Montreal Protocol, uh, and that has been revised and updated every so many years following that. Then we have Exxon Valdez, which is the, <laughs> a big tanker up in Valdez, Alaska, uh, that runs aground on Bly Reef, and uh, terrible things happen and releases occur. Not as bad uh, as what happened in the Gulf more recently, but we didn't have the tool to deal with that. The Clean Water Act really didn't deal with it very effectively. And so we developed something called the Oil Pollution Act to make sure that ships and vessels and facilities that could have those types of incidents uh, have certain standards uh, and also that they have certain financial responsibility components or instruments in place. And oh yeah, uh, we're not dealing terribly well with communities of color uh, and those who are economically disadvantaged. And uh, Clinton signs the executive order saying we have to do a better job and we have to be thinking about environmental justice throughout all of our programs um, as we go forward at the federal level and at the state level. Then we have the Kyoto Protocol focusing more specifically on greenhouse gases, obviously more on greenhouse gases uh, as you transition to California's vehicle emission standards and a focus on what are called mobile sources as opposed to you know, stationary sources or factories. We get into 2002 and we get amendments to Superfund. And those amendments say, while, we, while we're forcing everyone to clean up, we could also provide incentives and protections for those folks who want to redevelop brownfields or gray fields uh, and bring those back into productive use. And, and maybe this is a vehicle to do that and think, um, think in a productive, uh, you know, I would say proactive way to prevent future sites uh, from coming into play, you know, as sites that need cleanup uh, by the government. Following that, uh, we jump into the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015. Uh, we have the Obama administration's clean power plan, uh, which was an effort to say, gee, as to those coal plants as the one shown there, and I, I grew up in coal country in Pennsylvania, uh, but as to those coal plants, they really should be uh, over time phased out and replaced by uh, certain things through the market forces. And perhaps we can introduce market forces into uh, a bit of this law uh, and this and the passage of this law and the Clean Air Act and 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 facilitate and or encourage uh, a transition from coal, oil to natural gas and ultimately to uh, alternate energy sources. Uh, and then the final thing I will highlight here. And by the way, uh, you know, your Westland, uh, excuse me, your Tufts alumni, uh, uh, Gina McCarthy, as the administrator of EPA at the time. Uh, had a powerful hand in the clean power plan architecture uh, and in also its, you know, what I'd call shuttle diplomacy as she moved back and forth between her, her office and her position of power within the Obama administration uh, to those who would be regulated and affected. And she was incredibly effective at getting buy-in from a number of those who would be uh, regulated. We then moved to 2016 and in 2016 you had uh, the Frank Lautenberg Act, which says, well, okay, all those chemicals in commerce, we start to have to go back and, and look at those things more critically. Then what? Then 2017. Um, so President Trump takes office um, and he takes a look, a hard look at what I would call the potential you know, tools for change. And within the executive branch of the government, obviously that's where he sits, but you have certain cabinets and councils. Most important is the Council of Environmental Quality. Um, the Council of Environmental Quality, I worked there for a little bit of time, uh, is that group that oversees the National Environmental Policy Act. We're gonna talk about that in a second. In that executive branch, you also have critical agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency, like the Department of, uh, Department of Interior, uh, which oversees our public lands, like the Army Corps of Engineers uh, that uh, oversees certain of the Clean Water Act permitting obligations, and like the Department of Justice that obviously is involved with certain enforcement. 
those agencies, EPA, Department of Interior, well, EPA and, and, and the Army Corps of Engineers in particular are charged with coming up with regulations, have guidance, have policies, and of course the president can issue executive orders. So those are tools for change. Uh, your House and Senate can always make changes through the legislation that they pass. And over on the judicial side, um, you have, you know, the Supreme Court, Circuit Courts of Appeal at the federal level and district courts. And notably in, in that arena, all three of these things are important, but I, I highlight that because we're not going to talk about it much. But this president has put in place over, I think, 220, now it's 221 or so, um, federal judges who, who will sit forever. And, and um and that's out of a total batch of, I think, 794 uh, federal judges or something uh, like that. And somebody may correct me on those numbers, but it's close. So that so in three, three and a half years, an incredible number of judges who will sit and make decisions about what? What the legislation means, what the regulations mean, and whether enforcement is fair uh, as brought uh, by EPA uh, or other environmental agencies. So who do we, who are the agents of change? Uh, so first we, we select Scott Pruitt um, and Scott Pruitt was a, a person who had brought uh, during his stay at Oklahoma, 14 lawsuits against EPA, had repealed uh, once he was in office, EPA's broader authority over the water pollution uh, uh, provisions of the Clean Water Act, had so, sort of selectively removed objective scientists from the EPA advisory board and then uh, was put out of office after, uh, among other things, uh, sort of certain financial transgressions uh, that were embarrassing to the president. Um, among those was, uh, you know, paying $50 a night for a condo in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, that, that condo happened to be rented to him from a lobbying firm that secured pipeline expansion plans uh, from approvals from EPA. He gets replaced uh, by Andrew Wheeler, uh, and Andrew Wheeler was a former lobbyist for the coal industry. Um, he, in turn, upon coming into office, has taken aim at any number of the sort of science advisory uh, rules, eliminated EPA's office of the science advisor, uh, restricted the use of scientific data by EPA, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, because I think it's incredibly important for some of the decisions that have been made uh, over the last X number of years. He gutted uh, Obama's 2015 coal ash rule. Obama was concerned about coal ash, uh, coal ash residue impact to groundwater uh, storage locations, um, you know, that were both historic and ongoing. Uh, he then became uh, the principal force behind rolling back the Clean Water Act protections, which we'll get to in a second, and removing at least 18% of the, the nation's streams and 51% of the wetlands from, when I say being covered, what I really mean is by being uh, considered waters of the United States and therefore regulated in terms of the uh, impacts that we might have on them. He weakened the uh, mercury emissions rule and ultimately rescinded uh, the clean power plan that uh, had been part of the Obama administration, replacing it with the affordable energy rule, which we'll get to in a second. So, so those are your agents for change. What are the tools? Uh, what are the tools at the disposal of this administration? What have been the tools uh, at the disposal of this administration? There are more than these, but I, I've tried to give you five to be thinking about because this administration used these five to great effect uh, and um, in a remarkably short uh, duration. You can attack those substantive laws, those laws that I just talked about a few minutes ago that ran from you know, 1969 uh, with the National Environmental Policy Act all the way up through 2015. So you can attack those in terms of how they're written, what the regulations are that the EPA uh, uses to uh, determine what a water of the United States is, for instance. You can also focus on procedural changes to the regulations, which make interpretation more difficult, uh, enforcement more difficult. And those can be effective changes within the body of regulations that are out there. You can also alter where the budget money goes and how much is available. 
you can alter the enforce what I would call is the uh, enforcement ethos or ethic and, um, and and change how enforcement will occur, when it will occur, and whether it will occur. And then as to public lands, obviously you can think about whether divesting them is appropriate, shrinking them is appropriate, leasing them is appropriate, and you can use all of those tools at, at the same time. I put a little asterisk uh, down at the bottom just so we don't forget because it's not part of today's talk, but that asterisk is meant to focus on, gee, if we have disputes as to what that substantive law means or the procedural change or the enforcement decision, or even the divestiture of lands, uh, where does it end up? It ends up in front of the judiciary. So again, a, a, a terribly important piece of the puzzle. Here's the substantive scorecard. Brookings Institute has a scorecard. New York Times has a scorecard. National Geographic, I thought, had one of the best scorecards, although they discontinued it after a period of time, but it's worth looking back at. Uh, and, and you know what it does is this one happens to provide a nice little chart saying, okay, you know, what has been going on in the air pollution and emission side? Well, you know, there have been 21 rollbacks completed, five in process for a 26 total. Uh, there's a whole lot going on in drilling and extraction, as you might imagine, uh, relative to both oil and natural gas. Uh, there's a whole lot going on on the infrastructure and planning stage as to what will be exempt from certain levels of review and why. Um, on the animal side of the equation, the Endangered Species Act has been under attack and has been changed. Water pollution programs have been under attack, have been changed, and toxic substances and safety have largely been under attack more on the budgetary side than on, as you can see here, not, a, a not nearly as many rollbacks. Uh, and then there are others. A couple examples on the substantive side. I, I mentioned NEPA as an incredibly important law. The folks who wrote it had a, a, a tremendous you know, I think insight as to where things needed to be. And this law is a simple law. It's elegantly simple. It says major federal actions with potential to significantly affect the environment need to do something. Uh, they need to probably go through an environmental impact statement evaluation, which, which looks at the impact of that action, but all of the alternatives. And it would look at cumulative effect of this action combined with other actions that are out there and conditions that exist. Trump era revisions, and, and these are done, uh, they're in the books. We're gonna separate uh, the concept of defining major federal action and delink it from significant effect on the environment. Why? Because that way, if we delink that in, in the law, we can have something that's a modest or more modest federal action, even if it has a whopping uh, environmental impact, we don't need to go through this process and this law is not triggered. So that's a significant but subtle uh, change that has occurred. Um, the second is the elimination of the consideration of cumulative effects. The courts might say that that was uh, illegal, but what, what they actually, actually did in the law was, it used to be in the definition, the actual definition of effects, the word was you know, cumulative. You will look at things that are cumulative effects. Um, and and within that definition of effects, they now simply removed from the definition the word cumulative, uh, leaving open, okay, the argument from the government now would be, we don't look at cumulative effects. Um, the courts have said, of course, you do look at cumulative effects uh, historically, but we do have new and changing judiciary. Um, you should only consider reasonably foreseeable effects. Uh, again, this is a, you know, a direct or indirect attack on uh, climate change as a consideration in the context of looking at actions. This now excludes extraterritorial extra activities or decisions. What does that mean? That, that, what that means is, gee, to the extent the U.S. is putting a lot of funds or funding into you know, knocking down a portion of the rainforest, uh, we no longer need to consider uh, that if that was our action or if that is our action because it's outside of, of the U.S. boundary. It also, this law for the first time, allows a proponent uh, of a project to, to actually prepare the environmental assessment or the EIS. Up until now, the agency, the governmental agency that might allow or might fund something had to do that. 
Now, to the extent there is a proponent of a project that is a private sector proponent, it can step in and perform the EIS or the EA. The law also set uh, aggressive time limits for the preparation of these and um, aggressive page limits. When I say aggressive, meaning modest, a modest amount of time and modest number of pages to be used. So major changes in this one law, just as an example. The Endangered Species Act, um, again, our only real law dealing with biodiversity at this point in, in, in this country um, has been under attack. And that attack has resulted in revisions. Um, those revisions are, have been you know, fairly well publicized. Um, what the law starts out with is a listing of the species and their habitats. And among other things, a recognition that if federal action in any way is going to occur, it can't cause jeopardy to those species or their habitats. Um, the revisions focus much more on defining the habitat as the current habitat. Um, and what that was designed, and I think you know, the intent was, let's not talk about where that habitat or where that species might migrate or move uh, as a result of something as spe speculative uh, as climate change. It also requires that federal actions only consider impacts that are reasonably foreseeable, pointing to time and geography. Both of those uh, changes, and there are others in the Endangered Species Act worth talking about in my class, uh, but both of those have climate change implications. Clean Water Act, uh, I, I'm going a little bit more quickly now. Clean Water Act, um, you know, where we were uh, was under the Obama administration that once the Obama administration was constrained by a Supreme Court decision, uh, which was a very complicated decision, it's a, it's a fascinating decision, but a very complicated decision, the Obama administration said, we're going to take the best language out of that, which says that if a water has a significant nexus, if a wetlands has a significant nexus to what is a traditional water of the United States, we can regulate it. And then they developed a template for doing that. The Trump revisions didn't look at that language, which is in the concurrence in that Supreme Court decision. They went back to what's called the plurality of that decision. And they focused on a standard that had never existed in the law, never existed in the prior Supreme Court decisions, was written by Justice Scalia. And in that decision said, no, it has to be you know, fully connected by uh, water that is flowing on a year round basis. Again, uh, incredible shorthand that I've given you for something much more complicated, but it, it narrowed, considerably narrowed, and that's how they narrowed the definition of water of the United States. And again, that is something that's passed. And I share this with you just so you have it, uh, but this was the, the graphic that went into the proposed redefinition by the Trump administration. And this, in fact, ended up being the final definition. So it excluded, it excluded ephemeral streams. If you can see those on that chart, it excluded uh, what would be more isolated wetlands. It excluded uh, more isolated ponds uh, and, and, and left, uh, you know, real question, even if that wetland was located here uh, or near uh, one of the uh, clearly navigable waterways, it, it, it would or could be excluded if there wasn't some sort of continuous connection uh, and flowing connection to what is a traditional uh, waterway. So again, complicated area, but, but major revisions under this administration. Clean Air Act similarly went from what I described to you earlier as the Obama Clean Power Plan designed to uh, you know, encourage and, and use some uh, regulatory means by which to encourage market movement from coal uh, and oil to natural gas to alternative energy. Um, the Trump administration eliminated that and said, no, you know, that, that's not happening, that's illegal. And uh, that got challenged in the courts initially and then held up entirely. The American Clean Energy Plan that was promulgated by the uh, Trump administration focused on specifically fence line regulation. In other words, inside the fence line of the coal plant, looking at those existing sources, you have to or should adopt and states should adopt one of seven or eight means by which to regulate those sources. 
but that but that particular law has no standards in it. And so when I say it's in litigation, you know, there's been a challenge to that particular plan and and the response by the court initially has been, wait a minute, where are the standards? Uh, we, we at the DC Circuit Court don't don't see the standards and and so we're concerned with the legitimacy of the American Clean Energy Act uh, under the Trump administration. So procedural, what did I mean when I said procedural? Uh, so there's been a lot of science. There's been a lot of great science and peer reviewed science that has been relied upon by EPA to regulate companies, to regulate municipalities uh, and arguably to improve all of our lives. Um, what, what EPA uh, has said at this point is, and it's interesting how they'll label something, strengthening transparency and regulatory science. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, but what they've said is that unless all of the underlying data is to be released as to how we arrived at that standard or this standard, unless all of that data is going to be made publicly available, it can't be used. And included in there are confidential medical records, which obviously can't be uh, released uh, without everyone's, you know, personal permission. Uh, and so you end up with an elimination of that body of science in terms of its utility, uh, either in drafting regulations uh, or in bringing enforcement actions. Um, and Andrew Wheeler took this one step forward and said, yeah, this should also apply retroactively to any other times we've relied on it. Citizen suits. Uh, under the environmental programs can be very important. Citizens are allowed to enforce any number of the environmental programs that I've talked about today. Uh, and they rely on that ability and they also rely on the ability to receive payments uh, through what are called you know, supplemental environmental projects uh, as a result of having been brought that. This uh, Department of Justice edict or guidance says that's no longer going to be the case. So obviously it, it can have or could have a chilling effect. Similarly, uh, you have another Department of Justice guidance as recently as March 12th of this year that prohibits uh, and generally prohibits uh, supplemental environmental projects in civil judicial settlements. And then you have, interestingly, all these guidance coming out saying you can't use guidance. Um, I mean, there's, there's a catch 22 here to a certain extent it says Guidance is not to be used for any number of things, and yet guidance is being used to say that guidance can't be used. So I won't, I won't go over that too much, but uh, it, it's an interesting moment. Here's another example of procedural. Now these looked innocuous, I think, to many, uh, but they set up procedures that needed to be followed, briefings that needed to occur if, in fact, a, a case was going to be referred to the Department of Justice and agreement from the Department of Justice if a penalty was going to go over uh, $362,000 uh, against a given company. Well, as you might imagine, if the agency is thinking, well, gee, we, we'll bring this case for $550,000 uh, against so-and-so, but oh, wait a minute, no, we, we've got to run this back and run, run it through our regional administrator. We've got to also run it through the Department of Justice. Uh, let's pick 360. Um, so even something like this can have uh, a behavior altering uh, component to it. Budgets. Quickly going down, I just give you this uh, quick uh, summary of what has been happening. While the budgets have been fairly flat at EPA, uh, they've gone down considerably at uh, NOAA, uh, and NOAA obviously has done a lot of work and a lot of research in the climate change arena. And even within EPA, if you scratch the surface further, uh, you'll notice that, that where the budget cuts have come uh, is in science and technology research, uh, which is down 23%. And I gave you a, a few of the other statistics. Clearly, that has been the attack. One of the most startling things to me, and I spend a fair amount of time at EPA, as you might imagine, either the, the various regional offices or headquarters in DC, was you know, in, in one week, all of the signs within EPA's hallways, meeting rooms that would talk about or speak to the issue of climate change were removed. Everything, any reference to climate change uh, was gone and, and, and it was um, uh, fairly remarkable. Enforcement, uh, I, again, I just give you a, a little bit of a flavor. So you have a sense of the various tools that have been in play uh, during the last four years. 
70% decrease in Clean Water Act prosecutions, 50% decrease in Clean Air Act uh, prosecutions. Uh, and you can see that the Trump prosecutions are lowest uh, that they've ever been, uh, well, since uh, early 2000 anyway, um, on, uh, <clears throat> on the basis of matters being brought and in addition uh, on the basis of matters that have been prosecuted to conclusion. In the last remaining minutes, uh, you know, I thought there's this other piece. Uh, this other piece is largely the province, not of EPA, uh, but rather of the Department of the Interior. And, you know, as long as I've been practicing, there have been battles uh, over whether or not to open the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for some level of oil and gas exploration and extraction. Um, that has largely not occurred, well, has not occurred uh, until uh, this administration when it was recently approved uh, for certain levels of activity up there and the leasing of uh, certain public lands. In addition, uh, you know, there have been things like these, uh, that the Bears Ears National Monument has been reduced in size by 85%. The Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument has been reduced in size by 51%. And, you know, if you read today's news, uh, Trump hopes to open more than half of the Alaska Tongass National Forest uh, to logging and development. And again, I apologize for any mispronunciation of those, uh, those designated resources, but, uh, you know, I thought you should be aware there's a, there's a play. Now, who had we, we hadn't put Pruitt or Wheeler in charge of those um, activities. We had put uh, initially a, a guy by the name of Ryan Zinka. And uh, Ryan is the guy famous for riding his horse down the streets of Washington to go to his first day on the job. Uh, he made it forward for a little while, uh, opening up uh, public lands. He was from Montana. And then he, uh, he was found to be committing some of the same improprieties as Scott Pruitt was. Uh, and was let go from his position. He was replaced by David Bernhardt as the Department of Interior uh, head. And, you know, David was formerly a lobbyist for the oil and gas industry. And, um, and again, has been a proponent of opening more and more of our public lands for uh, resource exploration. These are pictures of no longer part of the Bears Ears. Um, guarded optimism in my last second. Um, some states have chosen to go well beyond the federal standards. That's true, and that's uh, remarkable, has been remarkable, and many of those states uh, have chosen not to roll back. Even if they administer the federal programs, they've chosen not to roll back their environmental standards, so their, their programs are still on the books. Um, you know, I think there's an increasingly aware and engaged population uh, with citizen science more readily at its disposal, um, and what we have seen and what I predicted four years ago was, uh, you know, upon Trump's election, as enforcement was predicted to drop off, that there would be a commensurate uptick in citizen suits being brought. Um, citizen suits brought under the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the hazardous waste laws. Weird stuff happens is, gee, we do have a decision out of the Supreme Court of the US that protects certain waters that were unprotected and or were in dispute. Um, I'd love to talk more about it. I do cover conduit theory in my class. And then uh, to Sarah's initial point, we have election cycles, which give us hope uh, for both executive and legislative branches. So uh, get out and vote. Uh, and with that, I will stop for any questions and I apologize for going a little long. Thank you so much, Earl. That was a, a great talk, a little <laughs> serving, um, but it's, I think it's important to, to understand what's happened. And while we take some questions, uh, I would like to start with one, with two actually. So when I see the things you have described, the first thing that comes to my mind is how does the environment become a partisan issue to begin with? How can, uh, what compels regular citizens to uh, not stand against this? And second, um, assuming that the election goes in a different direction, what would be the best, the most efficient avenue to revert some of these, um, these uh, rollbacks? What is the most efficient avenue? Yeah, so those are three excellent questions. Um, you know, 
taking the first one, how do we energize, galvanize, um, you know, those members of the public? And I think the answer to that is making it real on an individual basis, uh, no different from other issues. You know, I have friends who might have political leanings other than mine that are avid fishermen, uh, truly avid trout fishermen. And, and when I start talking to them about the importance of the Clean Water Act and what has been the importance of the Clean Water Act, their immediate reaction is, oh my gosh, you, gotta, you, you, you have to figure out a way to get this out to our National Fishing Association to really focus on this and think about this in terms of the effect on us. And, and again, it's anthropocentric, right? It's, it's about us, but, but that is one way that I think that becomes, that becomes very real. I, I do think that the folks, you know, Tufts has a, an international, you know, community, but as people go back and think about their town, their state, m many of those federal programs are delegable, not all, but many are delegable. And so grabbing that opportunity to participate at the state level and communicate one's uh, perspective, and, and I, and I know many people don't believe that's important, uh, but I've, I've been part of conversations in any number of states where if you have the conversation with the right people with the right ammunition, things change. And so I have hope in that arena as well. And then obviously the election, uh, you will see different leadership uh, at each of those agencies. EPA will immediately have, I have a, a friend and classmate of mine um, who is the, highest ranking person at EPA who's not an appointee. Um, you know, he has held on to that job through this frustrating time with hope. And the hope is that the next administration will look back and say, gee, these programs have to be put back where they were and or improved upon further, uh, frankly. So again, I hope that answers some of your questions, Sarah. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's a good point. And also I think following that on that and answering a question for the Q&A, uh, you mentioned how the judicial is, um, it has significantly changed with so many new judges appointed, which will be probably harder uh, to tackle long-term changes. So along those lines, there's a question in the chat asking uh, what the role of the newly appointed Amy uh, Coney Barrett to the uh, Supreme Court, wh what kind of effect will have on environmental law in the long-term? Is there yeah. anything in particular that you are uh, well, I mean, I watched I watched the uh, the hearings uh, on the candidate, and I watched um, you know a sidestep relative to the question of climate change. Um, you know, and it was a silly sidestep in my mind because the science is there, and you know it's pretty unequivocal. Uh, so I, I felt bad about that. Where do I think the greatest impact from her appointment will be? Well, again, Trump has appointed three folks at the Supreme Court level, right? Uh, Gorsuch. Uh, whose mother was walked out of EPA as the administrator of EPA in shame. So Gorsuch doesn't have any lost love for uh, EPA. Uh, she was embarrassed in her position there. Um, then you have Kavanaugh and then you have Barrett. And I think that the one area uh, that will be under attack within the next uh, two years, perhaps even this year, will be deference. So Generally, there was a case, you know, it's called the Chevron Doctrine, but what the courts have said in the past is, and what the Supreme Court has said in the past is, to the extent that there's ambiguity in a regulation and there's, a, there's an interpretation provided by the agencies charged with interpreting that law, there will be deference given to the interpretation provided by EPA, for instance, right? Deference. I think that will be under attack uh, because, again, it's there are many ways that can it can find its way to come up to the Supreme Court, and it has been something folks have argued about for years. Now, if 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 the agencies lose deference, um, then it will in increase the number of cases where folks are far more willing to argue about whether they were or were not in compliance with environmental laws or what an environmental law says, because right now. You know, if someone comes into me and says, I want to fight that, I'm going to say, well, gee, the agency is going to be given deference. 
if I know they're not going to be given deference or their interpretation is not, you know, then that fight becomes a, a more even or level level playing field. So I think that's where she will be uh, weighing in, and I'm I'm you know going to watch carefully what happens there. Thank you. And to follow up on that question, there is another question asking about your thoughts for the Biden plan. My thoughts for the Biden plan? Uh, that's a broad question and probably deserves another three hours or four hours. Uh, you know, <clears throat> you know, I, I believe that he, you know, unfortunately in that in that moment in the debate that we some of us watched, uh, where he spoke about the need for getting away from oil, that was probably not his best answer. What he needed to answer was, you know, in my mind, a sidestep, which was he's, um, he's mindful of the greenhouse gas and climate change issue. He recognizes that we have to move away from, greenhouse, you know, from sources of greenhouse gas in a much more aggressive way. He's using the science, <coughs> science and scientists to point him at what is necessary for 2050. That's the way he should have answered it in my mind, as opposed to, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to attack oil because uh, right now, as Trump is making the rounds to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Texas, that's that's the soundbite. Um, so I think you will see if Biden's elected a very different focus. I do think it will not go back to the clean power plan because I think that is challenged in the court anyway. So it will be a Biden version of greenhouse gas. Um, uh, initiative. Thank you. Uh, another uh, person is asking, uh, is commenting uh, the fact that the, the interests of uh, large corporations are uh, look like they are all over the place, environmental uh, laws. So uh, sh and they're wondering if you could connect that uh, early into a transition of a, the possibility of a transition to a, a greener economy based on these interests present. Yeah, right. I mean, if the question is, are, are major corporations becoming more acutely aware of the interest of their shareholders and the public in their performance, their environmental footprint, and their environmental decision making, the answer is yes. Right in your backyard, you have a tremendous organization series. I will be in touch with them uh, you know, later today or uh, tomorrow, probably, uh, that, that is focused on sort of investor awareness and, and responsiveness from corporate America. You know, full disclosure, most many of my clients are corporate uh, interests and most of those clients are highly committed to and have invested heavily in environmental compliance uh, and sustainability and thinking about their footprint. Now, why have they done that? They've done that, you know, I'd like to believe they've done that because they've heard uh, the importance of it. They're aware of it. They have families themselves. They know about what will provide sustainable uh, businesses, but they've also done it because uh, shareholders have expressed interest. Uh, citizen suits have been brought. Uh, shareholder complaints have been brought for failure to disclose, witness some of the things that have been brought against uh, Exxon and other uh, uh, oil and gas companies. So I think there are various motivations in play. And I do think you know, as I said, you know, most of my clients are um, corporate clients, either private or public. So, you know, I have seen a, a significant change in that. Um, I won't say attitude. It was not an attitude as much as in the importance placed on uh, those elements. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, has the role of environmental impact assessment changed pre and post Trump? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, that takes you back to the National Environmental Policy Act. That is, the, that is where the language of environmental impact statement and environmental impact assessment comes from. Uh, and, you know, two things. One, the number of projects and types of projects uh, that get you into having to perform an environmental impact statement have shrunk. So the, the number of times when you're moved into that uh, set of requirements has been reduced. And then once you're in those uh, requirements of preparing a full environmental impact statement, the types of alternatives have uh, contracted under the, the law as it's been changed because you're looking at reasonably foreseeable uh, implications of a particular action. And that for some means 
we don't need to look at climate change. And then the cumulative uh, effects arena has been eliminated. And that means, gee, we don't need to look at the layered effect of this action along with every other action or the baseline that's out there. And we may ultimately be able to step away from some of the analysis of synergistic effects as well. So I, I, I hope I'm answering that question, but I think you've seen contraction on all fronts. States independent of the federal government who have many NEPAs have not done that same uh, contraction. So to the extent that there are state programs that are driving environmental impact statements, environmental impact assessments, I don't see any, I haven't seen any meaningful pullback there or contraction. Thank you. It's uh, one o'clock, so we're going to have to close it here. But thank you, Earl, for this uh, wonderful overview. And um, I hope students in the audience take the opportunity to, to take your class in the spring. Well, thank you. Yeah, again, thank you for the opportunity. It's wonderful and uh, always delighted to, to participate. OK, see you everybody next week. Right. Take care.